Okay, it's a real pleasure to have the keynote today. It's Gottfried Willem Raas, who's a really Renaissance uh, man. He's a composer, he's a performer, inventor, um, and a roboticist. And I don't think we could have a better keynote with us today to, give a, uh, to talk about his um, experience and work for this um, Alcometrica Festival. Um, Gottfried is the founder of the Logos Foundation, which is a foundation that was founded in 1968. So it's a long kind of existing foundation that has been focusing on musical mm -hmm. performance, contemporary music, and the, build, the building of, of uh, automata, musical automata. So I think uh, we, we have a very exciting hour ahead of us, and I'm just going to hand over to Gottfried. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> uh, when I did lectures so far, I generally tended to let it start with the Logos Group 1968. But now that I'm getting older, I'm sure that I have to go a little further back. Nowadays, I start realizing that the most important year for forming my career and my understanding of my later evolution might have been the year 1958. And I'll tell you why. For three reasons. The first reason is that 1958, and I think none of you will recall that, there was a world exhibition in Brussels. Big event, you know, we have these world exhibitions every so many years in, in a country, but 58 it was in Brussels. Now, I was only a boy, six years old. And there's a little bit of a sad story to it, because my parents were involved in the classical music, singing in the choir, etc., and were invited every stop to do concerts at the world exhibit. Now, I, as a little boy, was taken along, but they thought I was too young to sit through a whole classical concert, so they dropped me off in kindergarten. And that was a catastrophe. Because I entered in kindergarten and I started crying because the ladies that were supposed to take care of the kids spoke only French. Now I'm touching here a little political problem. And I spoke, I was raised in Dutch and I was bilingual because my other, my mother tongue is actually German. German. So I started crying and they didn't know what to do with me. And they had a most genial idea at some point. They thought, well, we can handle this little boy, let's bring him to the Dutch pavilion. Now, I don't know whether any of you know what the Dutch pavilion was at the World Exhibition in 58. That was the fan the, this fantastic architecture, a dome with a thing pointing out, designed by the Corbusier, but actually realized by Xenakis, wherein there was a sonic environment composed by Edgar Varese, the poem Electronique. Some of you may know that piece because that's a sort of a milestone in, in uh, the history of, like, of contemporary music, I must say. So it happened that I was dropped off in that pavilion and got a privileged place on the first row to experience this poem Electronique many days in a row, actually, and piece of about 20 minutes and many sessions, etc., taking care of, of a Dutch lady of the Dutch pavilion. And so it was all pleased. For me, that, <coughs> and there's only recently that I started seeing that this must have deeply influenced me because it was an environment. It was not just electronic music, maybe you, you know, but in this pavilion there was, it was filled up with loudspeakers. So it was a set of about 70 or 80 loudspeakers and lights. So it was really an environment, as in the, I think the first one, actually, in the history of contemporary music, it was completely sponsored by Philips, what was the Philips Pavilion. Okay, that's one thing. It's an important thing. There is another thing that's also related to this world exhibition. 1958, anybody what knows what happens in the space research that year? That was the, the launch of the Sputnik. The Sputnik was the first human satellite in outer space. It was made by the Russians, and it was about this size, because there was a model of the world exhibit that they did shoot off and brought in, a, I want to call that in, a, in orbit around uh, planet Earth. And the only thing it did was beep, beep, 
beep, beep, beep, beep, for about a month or so. I, I don't, don't take me on that. That was, but in any case, I found it as a child very fascinating. I will tell you later on why and what came out of that. And then the third element, also in 58, that's a final point for, the, for that matter, is that I got enrolled into the conservatory as all bourgeois child, ch children of, of, of my generation and my class, kind of. We had to do music studies. So at six years old, I get into the conservatory and had to study the piano. We had two pianos at home, quarter tone different, because one was an old style piano that couldn't be tuned to 440, etc. So that's a fun and nice. Anyhow, I didn't like the piano very much, and in order for me to do the practical work on the piano, I insisted on one condition. I would only do the piano if I could take the lids off and see the hammers. Because I wanted to see what the relation was between pushing the keys and these little, for me they were ducks, little ducks picking in the strings, you know, these felt hammers of an upright piano, etc. And only if I could see the ducks, I would make the ducks move, etc. I'd do my scales and things like that, I can't go faster and things like that. And I found it fantastic. So, needless to say, at the conservatory at some point, they found my way of uh, approaching the piano a bit mechanical. <laughs> <laughs> they they <laughs> insisted on me that I could play with my soul. But even as a, small, as a small kid, I had no idea what a soul possibly could be. But okay, let alone that. That's the 58 and what comes out of it. Now I will reconnect to the Sputnik because you may have wondered what did he tell about the Sputnik, what has that to do with it? Well, one thing. I lived in my youth right across the laboratories of the Ghent University. The laboratories where the mainframes were installed, where the people doing glass work for chemistry were working, and where they were soldering circuits together. And I was fascinated by these laboratories. And day after day I was sitting on the street side in front of the row looking at what the, those laboratory guys were doing. And they got to know me. Oh, yeah, there's again, again that boy at the door, at, at the window. And one day, one of these uh, technicians gave me a component, an electronic <coughs> part. Here, you can have one. And I was proud. And asked him, this component, and where, where is it for? And then he said, it's something like in the Sputnik. Oh, that raised my fantasy. I got a component from the Sputnik, imagine. You can put it in outer space and it will do, do wonderful things. So first thing I did was make from wood a little box for it to protect it because I, I thought it was very valuable. Later on, I discovered quickly enough that it was simply a resistor with colorings, very beautiful colorings, red, red, yellow, silver. If there are electronicians, electronics people under you, you know it's 220 kilo ohms. Simple resistor. <laughs> okay. But that uh, little resistor triggered my first interest in electronics. And I started collecting more and more components, such that, to make a long story short, at age 11, I made my first FM station on, on the on broadcast band and got arrested eventually. Because, because the police came in, etc., and I, I got it to work with vacuum tubes, uh, ECC83 uh, tubes, and some other things that, that I got, got the whole circuit working on the FM band. Imagine with frequency modulation. I had my, my friend uh, who lived, well, a few streets away, and really, he could hear me, so it worked. It was fantastic. And then, but after a couple of hours testing and probably doing weird things with uh, high frequency signals, the, the work must be, have been complaints because I was in the, in the audio, normal bands and, you know, it's illegal. Do that so the police came. Of course, they didn't arrest me because I was too small a boy. So they gave my parents a warning and took my broadcast station away from me. Okay, that's, I think, one of the last things I did with uh, broadcasting. No, by the way, I was not interested in starting a radio station. I was just interested in the technology and the fact that you could remotely speak with someone else uh, on a distance. But okay, that was uh, the, the problem. 
Okay, so I had this, I, I went on with electronics, and after that, and that was, I think, 64 or something, 64, 65, I started making sound devices. First of all, a tape recorder, because I always wanted a tape recorder, because at the Ghent University, they just uh, started with an electronic music studio, the IPAM studio, etc., and I was uh, friends with one of the engineering students there who worked in the studio, so I got to visit it and I knew the technology of tape records and I wanted also one. Of course, the price was quite, quite prohibitive. A, prohib a professional tape recorder was, for nowadays, prices something in the order of, well, 12,000 <coughs> pounds or something. You know, these uh, three motor, big telephone machines, very expensive. So out of the question that I would buy some. So I said, okay, I have to make one. And indeed, I made a few tape records, actually, to make my first studio, full track machines with three motors, and I got them working. That was the basis of it. Okay, that's the technology part. When it came to studying, I always had a dilemma. About what was I going to do? Was I going to do art, biology, because that's another thing I had some interest in, bio, bio, bioengineering also, uh, or electronics, and I think electronics I love too much. I don't want that element of, of my concerns being disturbed by academia. So let's not do electronics, let's take music. It seems more safe. Okay, now I make a jump, we are in 1968. Now, 68 is the beginning of Logos, and why is it the beginning of Logos? Because 68, and you know what, what the time is around that time, that's the time of Woodstock, of uh, the com communes, of the, the, the ecological movement, you can say, of also anarchist movements and things like that, of the student revolts. That, that's the atmosphere. So within that atmosphere, we found ourselves at the conservatory with a few other students along similar lines. And we made s sort of brave decisions. We made a manifesto, like everybody did that in the 60s. You make a manifesto for whatever you wanted to do. And in our manifesto, the first thing we said was, well, we stop with repeating the past. We don't play any old music anymore. Now, this is breaking a fundamental rule of any conservatory. Because in a conservatory, what you do, you get literature, you get to play Bach, Beethoven, etc., etc., the canon of the thing, and you repeat that. A musical expression consists of nothing but projecting your own expressive will into the texts written by the past. Imagine, what a paradigm. For us, it was unacceptable. So we made it into a statement. No, we don't do that anymore. Not because we are against old music, and at no point in my life I've been an enemy of Bach or Beethoven. That's not the issue. It's only that our culture can be considered completely sick if 95% of music production in concerts, etc., consists of nothing but historical music that is not of our time. This is insane, unhealthy, sick. Particularly because we noticed that our colleagues in the academies of fine arts, if you enrolled there, of course you made your own painting. It was out of the question of repainting Rembrandt or Van Gogh, etc. No, you should do something for yourself. You can do exercises for sketches, etc. Such as you can do harmony in the conservatory. But the basic thing is what you make in your own work not only producing something else. Now, of course, you can say, hey, you're, you're cheating us, huh? because music always requires performers. That's true. But why would it have to be historical music? There's no reason for that, other than, well, I'm not going into the politics of music. That's a completely different story. But of course, there is a reason for it, because our society doesn't really need new music. The old music sells better. And it has to do with the fact that at some point, it's a very sad point in our music history, the beginning end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, music became a product that you could sell. Now, before this, uh, the 18th century, music wasn't an object of property. It was commissioned, etc. It was written for purposes, for rituals. It was accessible for those for which it was accessible. I'm not saying it was for the people, not necessarily. That depends on the 
socioeconomical circumstances. But in any case, it was not sold at no point. Only at the end of the 18th century started sales of music, where you could buy the right to assist to a concert or opera production. This very strange idea actually has killed music and has made it into historical art. Because, of course, if you sell something, the, the act of selling something means that you have to get money in exchange of something. Now, who is going to buy something from me if you say, I have something, give me 10 pounds. You don't know what it is. You say, hey, <laughs> you're a clown. You may do that one day for, for, for a joke. But you cannot base a culture on selling the unknown. Selling can only be selling of the known. That's the popularity of pop music. You make, you make stars, etc., and you, can, you sell Bowie. And the more it's got known, the better it sells. That's the stardom. But that's also a killer undermining music culture. Now, th this kind of ideology, I, may, I said already too much about that. I think it was at the basis of, of Logos when we started. So we refused this whole production. We refused also to do records and to materialize all music. We wanted it to be public domain, no royalties, no copyright, no nothing of this kind, everything open source, open music, and no, no, no market around it. It was also another political issue that has to do with the start of Logos. We were a commune. We just lived also as, as a commune. And one of the points was that we didn't want to make money with music. We thought making money with music sickens it. It's uh, because you would get, have the risk of polluting your ideas in, 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 in exchange for market possibilities, for more market. And we didn't want that. We wanted to do, concentrate on music and only new music. Now, we were students at the conservatory, so I was trained in piano, did also some clarinet and percussion studies and composition. And uh, my colleagues played the cello, the flute, the oboe, uh, the organ, and well, very traditional instruments. And we started realizing very soon that it was something, well, that it was okay to say no to reproducing historical music. But there we were stuck with these instruments. And when you think about these instruments, there's something very odd about it also. We still play violins. Imagine, there are still people so crazy as to study eight hours a day a violin just to try to master it. And that's an instrument from the 17th century. Isn't that strange? Isn't it strange that we still play clarinets, saxophones, guitars for that matter? It's the same. There is something fun fundamentally strange. It's as if our past has given us the perfect tool for musical expression. And we are still stuck with those tools. So of course, in the spirit of 68, we thought, OK, with these traditional instruments, certain things can be done. We didn't turn them down, because that would give us completely loose grounds. So we have to give other approaches. And what was the approach at that time in the conservatories? Well, no, not in the conservatories, but with the progressive people in music. You started applying extended technique <laughs> and extending the instruments by playing quarter tones, multiphonics, by doing circular breathing on the instruments, and all sorts of, by preparing pianos, uh, do all sorts of things to the instruments in order to extend the choice of expressive possibilities you could get, get from those expressive tools. OK, that's one line. The other line is, of course, you can say, and that was actually the path I took, was, well, Maybe we should drop all those old instruments altogether and concentrate on producing new tools for music, musical expression ourselves. And obviously, being 1968, around that time, what was our hope? What was the prospect? Well, only one thing was possible. Electronics, of course. And there, this other line from my childhood sneaked in again into music. And I used my knowledge of electronics to the benefit of developing new instruments. So I have, must have built, not hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, but at least 20 different models of synthesizers, modulating equipment, ring modulators, tape recorders, Springer machines for pitch shift uh, things, etc. First in analog technology, well, the early seven, late 60s, <coughs> early 70s, later on, 
when the first uh, possibilities for digital circuitry came on, I started working on digital circuitry, make, making sequencing things, uh, memories, and things like that. Okay, that's a whole evolution. At the end, at the, at the end of the 70s, the first microprocessors came in, and I made circuits using a 6504 processor, if I remember it well, with one kilobyte of memory, <laughs> and things like that, just for sound generating things, etc. So, well, I have something. And also, but that connects, it may, may, may be of some interest, because it relates to my robotic work, but that's also due to my university studies. I was uh, introduced into computer programming in the late 60s, I think in 69, I did my first program on a mainframe <coughs> computer on Fortran, on with cards, punched hole cards, and you had to bring in your cards, etc. And then at, the, at night, when you got computer time, you got the result of your program. Okay, but that was far from real-time music. It was just for calculation work and for learning how to program computers. Actually, the first program I wrote didn't do anything with music, or for music generation, it analyzed Beethoven string quartets. But okay, <laughs> that does a little note. It was an exercise in musicology, in musicological anal analysis. Now, okay, with Logos, we were a performing group, so we had many concerts with all this electronic gear that I had designed and developed over the years. And there is where the problems began, because <coughs> electronics appeared not to be a good way. And why? Well, first of all, because electronics on stage, and I'm now first making the statement and then I will explain why, undermine the so necessary rhetoric of music, the seductive possibility of music. Seduction in music consists of the fact that there is an immediate link between what you see happening on stage and what your sonic experience is. See, if I do something like Okay, this is nonsense, but it is pure expression. You cannot deny that. There is a whole a series of emotional constructs of scentic forms to use to paraphrase Manfred Klein's that I have used to make a musical sentence. No rhythm, no pitch, well, no organized pitch, I mean, no melody in the traditional sense. But this is the thing. Why does that work? And I think it does work with any audience, even in Africa, because that I did it as an experiment. I went to many, many places all over the world experimenting with the, the essentials of a musical expression. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I drop off there. Um, Where's my line? <laughs> oh, yeah. This. Why does it work? Yeah, why, yeah, does why, it, why does it work? Uh, yeah, yeah, why, well, yeah, of course, of course. It does work because of this immediate relationship between the motoric of my movement, even if my gesture when doing corpu is minimal. I move my, my head a little bit and that. But there is an immediate connection between the action and the results. With electronics, however, this thing becomes problematic. First of all, because if you use electronics, you're bound by necessity to use loudspeakers on stage. So to dissociate the action from where you hear it. It comes from loudspeakers, left, right, or wherever you want. And my actions may provoke that, but may also not. In any case, my actions become unintelligible for an audience. And if the actions become unintelligible, not something you can be empathic with or can associate with, it doesn't help to understanding the music. And I always give this example, and those of you who are familiar with electronics will immediately know what I mean. You can put up a slider pot, and then a sound may go higher or may become louder, etc. You can do that with a rotary potentiometer as well. It goes louder, etc. 
but there is nothing, but nothing in the intrinsic action of turning that, would, that makes it louder there. You don't do more effort or anything like that. Moreover, if you solder the wire, wires the other way around on the back of the potentiometer, it works the other way around. And it gets softer the more you turn to the right, or it gets softer the more, more, more you put the slider up. That's just a matter of how you wire your electronics. <coughs> what I wanted to say there is that the gestures we do with electronics are fake. They are undermining rhetorics. They do not help you anywhere to this extent that I, maybe I should tell you that story. A friend of mine, a composer, the son of Robert Ashley, actually, Sam Ashley, once did this at Logos in a, in a concert as an experiment. He set up on stage a whole table with equipment, analog equipment, digital equipment, whatever, lots of cables everywhere. You know, the typical setup you saw him on yesterday night also, with tables full of equipment and, and things hooked up. He sat at the table and he started the performance. After the concert, everybody, oh, nice concert, nice concert. Until then, he declared in public to the people, did you know, I didn't play one note. It was just all playback. I just inserted my CD, plunge, said play, and then did actions. And people felt very cheated, so we're really mad at him. <laughs> but I think that has taught them a lesson. Because it's true, and it applies to most of our concerts, particularly where you see a guy sitting with a laptop computer and a PD patch or something, or Maximus P, pop, 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 to do something, etc. Finally, what he's doing may just be checking his email. <laughs> it, it's completely irrelevant what you do. It's the, the, the hard truth is that a laptop computer is not a musical instrument at all to the least extent, much less so than even a box of synthesizer where you still have cables. But this is crippled music making. OK, from this idea of this complete failure, and now don't misunderstand me, I'm not against electronic music, not a bit, because I think electronic music is very useful to make, but for other purposes than for live performances and for seducing audiences. It is perfect for making radio music, film music, CDs production, whatever you want, dance music, or whatever you want, but don't perform it on stage. <laughs> OK? Got the message. <laughs> well, what was my answer on that? The first of the, uh, th thing I thought was, let's rethink what's the essence of a musical instrument. After all, a musical instrument is an object that we handle with our motoric in order to produce sounds. In the mo more general sense, that's what a musical instrument is about. What is essential is that we handle it with our body. Now, then I had this more or less smart idea. Well, it's not so smart because it goes back on older people like German, etc. What if we could remove that prosthesis that an instrument is from the body and use the body and its movement itself as the instrument, such that the body becomes the instrument. That would liberate this. Because, let's be honest, there's probably some traditionally trained musicians amongst you. But a musician normally has a very intimate relation with his instrument. It's sort of like a prosthesis, as I said, an extension of your body. But at the other hand, just like a wooden leg, it's also a nuisance. If you're a clarinetist, you're always suffering from a bad read. You're always suffering from lack of practice or from saliva that comes out and clutters your tone. If you're a violinist, well, I'm not telling you about all the medical and other problems that violinists have to undergo to do this cruel instrument to play. It's very unhealthy. It makes you deaf on one side. You have to tune it all the time. It gets out of tune. You're, it's almost impossible to play right in the high pitches, in the high positions. Oh, well, OK, impossible things. But the instrumentalists also love their instruments. They also, it, it's an intimate thing. It's not like something they will throw away like another piece of crap or consumer good. No, no, it's something close to their body. So my idea of trying to capture the body as such in its motion would liberate the musicians from two things. First of all, it would liberate them from having to use prosthesis with all the problems. problems. Uh, and secondly, it would have this advantage 
that they, are, that they could develop a motoric capability that would be more universal. See, one of the tragedies of a conservatory stu student is, suppose you are trained on the violin, you did all this effort to study the instrument well, and one day you fall off a ladder and you break your left hand and your finger has to be amputated. Okay, there it goes for the violin, that's it. Say, okay, now I'm gonna take up the French horn. Well, you have to get, start up from the beginning, all again, because nothing of what you have learned, apart from general musical skills, but from craftsmen of, of playing the violin, is useful for playing the French horn. Nothing. So you start all over again. Isn't that anachronistic? Isn't that fundamentally anachronistic? We live in a time where for everything that in our lives that, that we do, like for instance, we walk, etc. We have invented technical tools to bring us fur. I didn't come walking to Sheffield or swimming or something. Now I took an airplane and a car and a train, etc. Not, not even a horse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why should, you say, should in music, should we still use these old, old things? There I am again. Now, because I shouldn't go too long in this lecture, I got more time than all of you, so I'm in a very privileged situation, but uh, I have to watch out every so often. I know. My idea, and that is something I worked on between uh, 76 and until I did my doctorates on this technology until 93, and it's still ongoing, but that was sort of a final uh, mark. I developed my invincible instrument. Now let me tell you a little bit about how it works. Now we got, get into hardware design and a little bit into software design also, gesture control. Well, my idea was to, uh, defining first the conditions for an instrument, for an invisible instrument to work. Of course, I was familiar with historical work, like the iconical work by Lev Theremin, by doing the theremin, etc. What is a theremin? It's a, a heterodyning instrument with an antenna, play tuned to a high frequency with a second oscillator, and there's a mixer, you hear this, the different tones. One of the tuning circuits you detune by approaching the antenna, it goes up, and by going away, it goes down. Okay, that's it. What's the problem with the theremin? Left theremin thought I was going to make a violin that's not so difficult as a violin, something that's not that's not this prosthesis effect, because you would not have to handle uh, an object. Now, the, if it came out, to make a long story short, the, uh, the theremin is one of the biggest failures of organology, of instrument design, because it's a million times more difficult than a violin. And why, wherefore? Well, because we are not spatial. We don't have absolute spatial feel. And you, to make pitches, predictable pitches, I mean, not wee, 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 like they do in some pop groups, that's not theremin. Uh, if you do it precise, <laughs> you have logarithmic scalings in your distances, and you have to have an absolute uh, referential system to do that, and almost nobody, to a certain extent, Lara Rockmore, uh, succeeded in doing that well. In fact, why is the theremin so difficult? Because it misunderstood a fundamental aspect of musicianship and of musical instrument making. I think exactly the physical, the, the mapping of pitches on spatial parameters is the mistake. Because that's exactly what we are so bad at. It, it, well, if it were effort-based, it would much more chances that it would work. So the term was, after all, you don't see it's not popular. Uh, you see, it was a failure. By the way, uh, if, I don't know if any of you know these performances by Clara Rockmore in the theremin, but you know what it looks like? She's standing there like this, like a medium. And why? Is this a sacrality or something? No, it's because if you start doing that or you start going with the music or something, it goes, <laughs> that instrument is completely unreliable. <laughs> You should, you should be as stable as a rock and do this. <laughs> not when your nose, not anything. No, I'm not. It's true. And you, for your left hand, it's the volume control, you know? So these, these two hands. Is this freeing a musician? <coughs> it's freezing a musician, I would say. 
Okay, so now to my alternative approach, say this is wrong. So we cannot use any topological kind of base technology for implementing a musical instrument using electronics. That was my thing. Refuse camera work. I know hundreds of people have used mock-up systems, video systems to try to map gesture into something musical. It's all a failure for different reasons. It's a failure. First of all, for the reasons that I pointed out with regard to the term, and secondly, for reasons that cameras are inherently way too slow. At 50 frames a second, you miss all of the micro-motoric that is essential in music musicianship. You know, the fine motoric that we have, and I did lots of measurements and studies about that for playing instruments like violins or whatever, are in the order of smaller than a centiseconds, between one and 10, uh, uh, millisecond. So that's much faster than you could have, could capture within frames at 30 frames a second. Now you're going to tell me, oh no, I've got this expensive camera that does 3,000 frames a second. Okay, yeah, it's laboratory equipment, but still it's the wrong way because it's, it's still topological. Now, my system, what I do is, and there's two ways technologically doing it. Either you can use sonar, ultrasound or a microwave. It doesn't matter for the mathematical principles behind it. I place the human body in a field of ultrasounds or, of, or a microwave in the 20 gigacycle ranges. Now, you stand here, with your body, I have my transducers let out in a tetrahedral model. So everything 60 degrees. You will see if you look into my work that tetrahedrons are an obsession of mine. It has to do with Lots of things, I don't have the time to go into that. You can ask me later on. Now, I have these three transducers, and when I stand still, nothing happens, because they are basically microphones, and I hear the system, as it, uh, the wave, as it is emitted from the emitter. As, however, as soon as I move, my skin reflects the signal, with, an with the reflection signal being in amplitude a function of how much of my body I move. So if you do a little finger, you will have very little signal from the uh, transducers. If I start shaking my whole belly, it will have sort of the maximum signal. That's about half square meter of body surface moving. That's a human constant, human body constant. Now, okay, so I can get the amplitude of the moving body because I have many transducers, I can figure out through mathematical analysis what the vector is, what the angle is under which you move, and more and most important of all, using a calculation of the Doppler shift caused by the signal, I can know how fast you move in which direction and what the acceleration is. The advantage of the system, which I call my invisible instrument, is it is completely wireless by necessity. The problem, well, so for some problem, you, some people seem to have problems with that, is that it involves naked bodies. Because obviously, since it works on the reflection from the body, if a house, you wear a pullover like this, you're contradicting the instruments because you prevent it from reflecting. So that's for technological reasons and for ideological reasons also. All my performances have to be naked using that technology because only then it works with the maximum, the optimum signal noise ratio, etc. So that's the instrument. Now, we have that thing solved, solved it's to say. I, this is only the low level thing, the signal, the signal acquisition, data acquisition on a moving body. It's the beginning of imp an implementation of an in invisible instrument. Next step is making sense of all the, these data. Because these data, if you make them, make them audible, there you sound like <laughs> they are noise bands, not sine waves, by the way. So you have to do, well, okay. To go short, I developed a whole system of software to categorize those gestures, well, to try to, to, to make from, the, from those uh, signals gesture categories, and I succeeded in isolating about 12 categories of gesture that are expressively relevant. For instance, collision. Collision, what is that? It's an acceleration moved, uh, followed by a sudden stop. This, 
That's the collision. Tak, tak, puk, tak, tok. A variant on this one is theatrical collision. Theatrical collision is when I do this. So at the last moment, I hold back. That's a signal, and it's very easy to detect. Another thing which you will immediately understand why I can do that is being airborne. When are we airborne? When we jump. Now, give you for the algorithmic people under you, it's simple. If you make a, for a spectral analysis of the reflected signal and you see that there is nothing in the lowest band of frequencies, it must be that you jump. Because normally, a body in movement, if a dancer moves, he normally is always somewhere in contact with the ground. Now, the Doppler shifts, if you're connected to the ground, always start from zero, a point of standstill, up to the maximum where you swing your body. But the zero is always be found, except the moment you jump. Because then, all of a sudden, the, spec, the, the, the Fourier transform will have a gap. So, okay, that's give you a cue about the, how the algorithm works. Then there is expansive movement. That's movements where the amount of body you invest in the movement increases, or the offering decrease in movement. And it's clear that those are already actually expressive categories, fundamentals, nuclei of uh, expressive elements. Okay. I'm not going to dig further, I have articles on, on that thing, but there is 12 gestural categories that I use. Now, I have to connect, reconnect to the instrument building. Having this instrument, I thought, okay, I'm having rejected electronics, and at first, I have used this gestural system with electronic synthesizers, etc. And the most successful mapping was not using synthesizers, but actually using my own voice. Since if I take my voice and I start modulating with DSP processing the sounds of my voice through gesture, you have really a hyperrhetoric instrument. That works fantastically. The only problem is that I did only one piece with it. It's a full night piece, but I don't see a way of doing a second one. <laughs> okay, but that's maybe some other people have ideas. So that led me at the beginning of well, the mid of the 90s to another idea. Because since I wanted to get away from the virtuality of electronic sounds, I thought there must be a way using acoustics again, but with the advantages connected to electronics, the advantages of control, precise control, etc., and without the problems of musicians playing instruments and things like that. And that's what led me into designing musical robots. And well, you I will see a few. I don't have much time anymore, but okay, I can achieve this. Now, I started making robots, many of them. Uh, at this moment, they are about 70. And why they are is, could you show yeah. the, the slides? You can just move them through. Brilliant. We're lucky we have uh, someone. Oh, it went to sleep in the meanwhile. Eh? <laughs> I must be very boring. The computer goes to sleep. <laughs> Even the computer falls asleep. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Computers. <laughs> <coughs> now there is different categories of instruments. First of all, I start automating known instruments. Why? Not because I wanted to just <coughs> automate, make robots to play traditional instruments, but to have a point of comparison. Because if I would have been starting with making robots that do just experimental sounds or whatever, how can you know that your robot works well? You can tell everybody, okay, it does the sound, that's what I wanted. Come on, you're sort of cheating. Whereas if you make a piano player or a player piano and it cannot play Waldstein Sonata by Beethoven, then it's a failure as such. If I make an oboe and it cannot play the Mozart concerto for oboe, then it's not a, uh, hey, don't come. Don't, don't tell me jokes, and it's a failure. You know, you will see, I have I've done 70 instruments. I will pass quickly through them, all implementing different, different approaches of either sonorizing traditional instruments or making novel ones. This one, you, would, you wouldn't believe me if I tell you that this is a cello. It is a cello because this is not one of the earliest ones I made, I always called, because it uses an, an EBO mechanism here. 
to both sides of the string that can precisely control the way the string moves. So the vibrational mode of the string is moved there. And I have exciters with little, little felt hammers because what, I, what was a failure with this instrument is to make it sound like a real cello. The steady state of the sound is very much like a stringed instrument. But the onset of sound is abbey slow. It goes always warm, warm, warm. Now, that's beautiful to a certain extent, but it's not a cello. And the reason is that we don't have enough energy, and there is no technological answer for that in the uh, emo mechanisms, because if you want a high amplitude, then the string moves quite a bit. Now, the force exerted by an electro electromagnet on the string is a function of the, of the square of the, uh, of the distance to the string. So if you make the distance smaller and make the force larger, then the amplitude must go down because it will hit the electromagnet and give an early metallic sound. So there is something, there's a design problem there. Okay, an another one. Oh, that's a, a reed organ. Well, no, 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 a reed organ. No, uh, 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 an accordion, sorry. <laughs> accordion, which has a, f a nice feature. You see, this is the compressor, radio compressor. goes into a valve, a four-way valve that I motorized with a stepping motor so that they can do the bellows that go op open and back, that you can implement that very fast. Okay, next one. Because I have 70 of them, and if I spend one minute with each of them, that's a complete hour. <laughs> so that's an automated saxophone, which led me, will tell me a few words about that, because it connects to the theme of this uh, very symposium. This is the most agile of, of the robots, because it can move forward, left, right, like this. It's a auto saxophone. This you can see, you can clearly see, this is the original instrument, and this is the robot, it is the player. And then you have the movement also, which I started implementing in the last couple of years, because I noticed that even having, using robots for sonification and for making the music, uh, you don't solve the problem of the rhetoric completely, because you have to give people a cue as to where the sound comes from. If a, a, an instrument starts playing like tut -tut -tut -tut, without giving a warning beforehand, it's something inhuman. A human player will always take up his instrument, a flutist. Long before he blows, you will know he's going to blow something, and your attention span goes into what it does. So I thought, I have to implement this element of gesture not only in the players, but also in the robots themselves. Next one. That's, that's the first one I made, believe it or not. That one is from the uh, early 90s. It's an also a saxophone, but a C melody saxophone, a very rare instrument, actually. Uh, I use one, I'm not going, not, not going to the details. Oh, this, this one uses, it for the sound buildup, uh, feedback mechanism with a membrane driver. There is, maybe I have time to say that. There is uh, some general remark on robotics. Many people that attempted to automate instruments stay, that's my experience, way too close with the way we humans play instruments. The first Sousa film that I made was an example of that. What I did is I had a wind machine to wind to replace our lungs. Then I had a mouth, a mouth cavity, big red pot. And inside I had silicon lips driven with solenoid, with a fast solenoid, a moving coil solenoid, uh, against the mouthpiece. So that's a perfect model of how we play the Sousa film. I did that instrument, and it's, it is in the series somewhere. Can you find the sousaphone? Okay, just go through it. Now, it's Baco. Uh, the bassoon, uh, reed organ, reed organ. Oh, that's for the Kifax twin. Uh, where is the sousaphone? <laughs> <laughs> I, there must, it must be in there. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There it is. There it was. That's the sousaphone. You see? That's the mouth. The, the wind machine is there. You have fingers for, do, for doing the valves, etc. Now, what was the problem with the sousaphone? It so, it's works so well that it makes the same mistakes as Jung. Jung's. If you make it, ask it to do pop, 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 then it may have a double tone. 
milestone, just like a tuba player. If a tuba player has to bring, right, uh, play large intervals, he may miss. He may have a double tone on a multiphonic at some point. Well, this one does that also. I did a lot of research on it and it came to the conclusion that wind is not a necessity in wind instruments. We need wind to make our lips vibrate, to do I cannot move my lips 40 440 times a second without pressure and wind. I cannot do I have 20 times a second maybe, but then I already use wind. So acoustic research shows that you can play trumpet sucking just as well as blowing. And that gave me the idea, OK, if suck and blow doesn't matter, then it can just go over and back. So why not just use a membrane compressor to cause resonance into the bore of the instrument as a source of excitation for the wind instrument? And that works wonderfully well with a much wider range of control that as a human you could ever achieve on any wind instrument. That's the secret about on all the later uh, wind instruments I made, made. I made an oboe, a bassoon, a cornet, a helicon, uh, what, ten. Ten wind instruments. It is clear that the reason why I make those instruments is not so much to replace traditional players, it's not much, but to go beyond what is humanly possible. It's trivial in the case of my player piano, because my player piano has 88 notes polyphony. Okay, we have only 10 fingers, so you're beaten. You lose. But not only there you lose, you lose also on the level of expressive possibilities. Because my player piano is capable of having a 16-bit resolution in the attack of every key. No human will ever be capable of doing this fortissimo, mezzo forte, forte, pianissimo, etc. in every finger separately and playing a piece like that at a re any reasonable speed. Simply because no matter how much we practice, we don't have the muscles and the nerves to allow us to have this kind of autonomy in our hands. But that's a clear example of where a machine, if it is well designed, beats and surpasses everything that is humanly possible. The same for the wind instruments, in terms of precision, of control, of pitches, they will surpass every, any human. I'm not saying to do that they surpass humans of every level, it's always an experiment. And to conclude the lecture, because I'm getting, I should get to the time, I can tell you one thing, is that robots, you can, if you do the effort, you can always make them better. And other people can build on my experiences and other people's experience to get them better. People, at the other hand, have achieved the maximum and don't get better. Thank you. <laughs> if there are any questions, I don't know what any yeah. foreseen questions. But I was strictly within time. Eh? Very good. <laughs> um, and we actually started a few minutes late, so I think we should uh, spend a few minutes. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask. I might scroll through these pictures as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a spinet levy board. Any uh, questions? I wonder if you had any recordings of these here. Oh, you say? Do you have any recordings of these? Yes, 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 if you want to hear. I have. I brought some CDs which you can have. Anyone who's interested, because, yeah, that's a that's a, an algorithmic fugue. I wrote a program to compose fugues, and it's performed by the robot orchestra. Any other questions? What was 
the most challenging uh, robot to build? There are, I can tell you, to be honest, I know there's many unsolved problems in robotics, in musical robotics. And it's a lecture in itself to go deep into that. But I can throw it at you what, right away. Strings, both strings. Nobody has ever solved it so far. I'm working on it. I did, you see many experiments. What I said about the cello is an experiment. But with limited success, it would do some one thing. The other instrument that you did see it also in the pictures, uh, the synchro chord, is an instrument where I use a plucking mechanism that plucks synchronous with the vibra vibrational uh, speed of the, of the string. So for instance, if you want an A, you have to strike it 440 times a second in phase. Problem there is that you need precise motors. Those I have and those do exist and I can program them. But changing fee speed fast is a problem because of inertia. So again, I can get a boat sound, but no speed. The problem is that the more I work in robotics, the more respect I gain for what we as human machines are, in fact, from a mechanical point of view. The agility of my fingers is unsurpassed by any now existing mechanism, believe me. There is nothing that does this with so many degrees of freedom than the human body. We can beat the human body in speed, in force, but not on all the parameters at the same time. There is not one single technical construction that is capable, like my left hand, to, to a pushing force only on a connector of 80 kilos. Try that with a balance, etc. Well, that's what I can do in any case. 80 kilos like that, and then have this agility to do that and that without overshoot. No robot will do that. That's the problem, actually, with that mechanism. I don't want to turn it down. Well, because I respect work on prosthesis a lot. But you think with the hand, etc. We saw this morning. This morning. Uh, the problem is this can never be better than a human, for principal reasons. First of all, the mechanism, if you make it fast, <coughs> needs a strong motor. A strong motor will be much heavier than this thing with a pulley. If it's a strong motor, it will have overshoot and will break. And then the fingers, if you want the fingers to give the force that, for instance, a piano player pushes on, on a key, then the hand will become very heavy as well, because an electromagnet with that degree of force weighs some 350 grams minimum. And I know what I'm talking about there. There's no, no solution about using a smaller solenoid. No, there's just, these are physics, physical constants. The only answer would be using pneumatics. With pneumatic technology, you can have uh, cylinders that move like that with a lot of force, but musically generally unusable because of the exhaust noise. You all pneumatic mechanism by necessity make <laughs> well, in a musical instrument that's problematic. But if you talk about problems, and there's many more problems, but uh, these are the limits. So we can beat humans in one parameter but not necessarily in the combination of all of them. <laughs> There's that question over there. Yeah. Oh, I know earlier on when you were saying that computers are not instruments, um, you can just go on stage and basically switch it off, like a tape recorder, I suppose. Do you, do you perform with these, with, with the, mechan well, the robot instruments? And I control them by gesture. Oh, they can, you can use, they can play pieces. And many, we have done uh, Linos with, by Stravinsky for uh, the robot orchestra. We have done the Dragoshin Opera by Kurt Feil with actors and singers, etc. We compose completely new pieces all the time. But my, the focus of my work is interactive composition, where I use dance, Namuda dance, naked music dance, actually, to control the robots, where I use the gestural properties and map those on behavior, composed behavior of the robots as a system. They can also listen to people also. They, because they have a pitch recognition commands on board, so you can do, if you want, an improvisation with the robots. You have to do some programming, but it is it's principally possible, yes. So those are... <laughs> How do we know that you're controlling them? <laughs> well, that's the problem. You, on the internet, you will see many videos of me doing that, or of or my, comp my dance company doing these things, and you cannot tell, because video is always cheating. Because we are used of the sound to be synchronous with what you see. The only way to convince you is you come to my lab or to any of my concerts, and I will do it for you. And you can ask me then, raise your hand, what will happen? Pack. 
and then I can't cheat anymore. <laughs> but that's, in fact, that's the re a problem of the reception for, for, for the audience. For, for, uh, I'm basically a musician, you know. I'm, I lo love being on stage, being convincing people, seducing people, etc. So it's a very rewarding uh, effort, uh, effect if you are there and you see that you can do bang, and this robot shoot off. And then you do, 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 and this plays along. Even if the audience may say you're cheating, but it would not be rewarding if it were cheating or just mimicking, etc. on stage. <laughs> yeah? I just wanted to <coughs> check I understand. Are you using um, musical instruments, um, the many musical instruments designed for humans, intact, or are you making New instruments. Well, both. Instruments to, to play instruments. Yeah, okay. So this one, one thing is that in the first generation of instruments, I took the instrument as such and sort of made a robotic player to play that instrument. Later on, I came to the, I, to the evident idea that in instrument building, is the instrument, history of instrument building, lots of the mechanics of, instrument, of me, instruments are not there for musical reasons, but only for anatomical human reasons, like the placements of the tone holes on the clarinet. Later on, I came to the conclusion, well, get away with everything human on it. Just take the tone holes as they are, remove all these mechanics, because they give only noises and give problems, etc., and you operate tone holes directly. It's still the original instrument, but the mechanism is different. If you see on the saxophone also, the saxophone has many more solenoids than we have fingers. Because the saxophonist normally uses these combination valves, these bridges, to action many valves at the same time. But that causes trouble. So I go to the basics of the instrument in those instruments. But then I have the new instruments, like the, the psh instrument. That's the name of an instrument, by the way. That's uh, consisting of old uh, shim shims of stainless steel from 100 of a millimeter thickness to much thicker that are actioned by sort of vibrators that can use, cause all sorts of standing waves into these shims. That's an unheard of sound. That's completely a new sound. That's not an existing instrument. And I have many of those. <laughs> it's funny that you, if, if you found uh, forms of instrument, forms of an instrument that is um, like not specific, um, or I guess you would like part of the process would be like finding the form of an instrument that's not specific to a human player anymore. No, uh, I start when I make a new instrument. I generally start from a, either technological idea or from a music musical need. For instance, the the shim machine was done because at some point my team wanted to do something techno-like with the robots. <laughs> and then there was one sound missing in the orchestra. We could have, have all these organs, these sluggish machines, these I don't know what, xylophones, etc. But we didn't have the <laughs> and this inverse cymbal sound that, is, that I found so typical in period te techno music. It's a typical thing you do with electronics. It's like, could I devise an instrument that makes something like that, but pure acoustical? And that's what that led me to making these metal shims. And that works marvelously well to that end. So that does an example of where a musical need dictated a design in, in the instrument. But sometimes it's also technological fascination. And because I do a lot of laboratory work and research, and eventually that leads to a practical robot. Now I'm now working to, to, to tell you something I'm working on, on right now. Maybe you will never be a robot is, you know how a car motor works. A cylinder, and there is a candle with a spark, and it ignites. And there's an ignition mechanism. I tried to make organ pipes out of those. I use open pipes with uh, some fuel in it, and then electrically control the sparks. And see whether, with the modulation of the spark frequency and waveform, what kind of pitches I can get from a pipe. I have an experiment set up, so it is possible. <laughs> okay, I think we have to end there. Look forward to that uh, new instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.